Welcome to The Summit Club, a weekly podcast series where I uncover the stories, the strategies, the pain and the elation behind the most highly performant people on earth. The Summit Club is based on one simple idea, that in the climb of life, there is no summit. Join me as we interview the very best performers across all human endeavors, as we uncover the tools and templates that they use to maximize their potential in their efforts to get to the summit. My guest today is Piers Collins. He's a tech entrepreneur from London. He's the co-founder of Hundo.xyz, a startup founded in 2020 with the mission to end global youth unemployment through Web3 technology, something that clearly I'm very interested in. I've known Piers for about eight years now, and he's one of the most impressive entrepreneurs I ever met. Last year, he completed a seed round of investment for Hundo, which totaled just under $3 million. Piers is the calmest man that I've ever met. And I can confirm in my experience, this is definitely not a common character trait that is congruent with tech founders. Piers, mate, thank you so much for joining me and welcome to the Summit Club. Thanks, Tom. It's a pleasure. It's been a long time coming, it feels. It's been too long, mate. It's been too long. Tell me a little bit about one of the things that I find most impressive about you. And this is a character trait around your attention to detail. You have one of the most, the highest attention to detail or attentions to detail of anyone I've ever known. I consider you kind of like a power nerd. Yeah. In a very in the way that you have the double threat of nerds, which is you have high intelligence and you also have high social intelligence, which is one of those things that um doesn't te- typically go hand in hand for nerds. So I, that's why I consider you a power nerd. So a question to you mate, are you a nerd? Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I'm definitely a nerd. I think it's something I've come to terms with as I've got older. I don't think I'd necessarily answer that question the same when I was in my 20s. But, you know, nerds rule the world. That's the truth. Well, so, that was my, my follow-up question was, how do you think in the world of 2023, being a nerd can, compares to how it was when we were at school like 20 years ago? What even is a nerd, you know? I think it's completely changed. I don't think necessarily what we would call like geeky or nerdy tendencies when we were in at school is the same now. And I think technology has enabled people to be who, you know, would traditionally be called nerds or geeks to actually be absolute power players in their own fields much younger um, than, you know, traditional industry or traditional professions where they rely on you to do, you know, you do 20 years, 30 years to get your you know, to get your stripes and then you get some kind of kudos in that industry. Tech, you can do it before you're 23. Like, to think how many tech entrepreneurs have made it before they're 25. It's, it's, it's a completely disruptive industry. And I hate that word disruptive because it's overused. But it is because it's, it's a superpower that, as a millennial, we sort of straddled both sides of it. So we're a little bit sort of hamstrung in, in many ways. But for the generation coming behind us, they're completely comfortable on technology um so i think i don't think they see i don't think gen z and certainly the generation comes behind the sees that classic like jock versus nerd split anymore i think that will hopefully die out in the next 10 years yeah i would have to agree i think if anything in the last five five years or so it definitely feels that there's been a bit of a flippening with regards to that kind of that jock versus nerd sentiment but that kind of brings me into a question around what you're doing at the moment, which is you're you're a tech founder and you have been for a few years now. Um, we'll speak a little bit about your transition from what you previously were doing, which was you were on that track path of the 20 year career, 30 year career. And then you, you veered off and you went on a tangent and we'd love to talk a little bit about that. But first, I think it would be good if we could give a bit of context as to what you're focusing on at the moment and tell us a little bit about Hundo specifically. I work in Web3, so I'm quite kind of familiar with what you guys are trying trying to do. And I definitely see you as being one of the most innovative solutions that I've seen in an area that does not get anywhere near enough innovation. So really excited to hear a little bit about what your mission is there and what your vision is. Yeah, of course. So... You know, I don't want to go bang on for too long because I can obviously talk about this forever, but picking up on what you just said, innovation is a really important word. And I think about this a lot 
it's not it's invention versus innovation i didn't invent anything hundo is a platform uh, that is essentially built to change the way that educators young people and employers interact in a more data rich way um, allowing better decisions to be made by employers in terms of who they hire with deeper data sets but also better decisions to be made by young people so when you're thinking about your education it's not that classic farm of going to school then uni then graduate scheme then you know whatever sort of being fitted fit into those sort of those holes it's actually giving context of every educational decision I make what skills am I acquiring and then how does that translate to the real future in my life you know do I need to go to uni if I've done these things can I just go and do this so it seemed quite bonkers to me that still relying on a CV a cover letter in many cases which is the most pointless document in the world which now chat GPT can write you in 10 seconds um, is, is is just clearly redundant and especially for an entry-level person, someone coming in without any experience, we've all had that terrible time of like, sit down and write your CV and you're like, okay, I'm applying for being a quant analyst in a hedge fund. And now I've got to write how I was working in a cafe in a garden center because that was my summer job and how that's made me passionate about being a quant analyst. Like we all do it. Uh, and it's like, I had to, as you, I was a recruiter in a previous life and just reading those CVs, they're all homogenous. They don't tell you anything. They're really low data. And I just felt like tech has to provide a solution that is better than this. And this is where Web3 comes in. As I say, like I didn't invent any of the concepts that we use and build on. I innovated them to create a use case that is basically engineering the social impact that I want to see in the world. Um, so without going into too much detail, we wanted to replace the CV because it's a terrible document, as I just outlined, we replace that CV with an avatar, cross-platform avatar supplied by Ready Player Me. So it travels with you through the internet. And behind that is a on-chain verified data set that essentially registers all the skills that you acquire through education and qualifications. They are then verified at source at the moment that you get them um, and then sit indelibly on that chain we're going really technical. We have soulbound NFTs that deliver those qualifications on chain um, and they're indelibly on that chain so that you, that then replaces your CV. You're actually collecting the evidence of your skills as you go along in real time. And you never have to go through that agony of getting to the end of education and then trying to sit down, remember it all and work out what you've done. Um, and then from the other perspective, an employer perspective, it allows more agility um an interaction with young people earlier on in their lives which i think is really important um, i always say like a football academy is a far better way of developing young talent which is why premiership football teams use them premiership football teams don't wait for all footballers to leave education give them a quick kick about on the football pitch and then pick their 11 which is essentially what the graduate recruitment market does at the moment um, so we use web3 concepts we're still a really web two platform, if I'm honest as well, like web three is, is still very much developing. And although we're using, you know, essentially crypto wallet technology to store those, those uh, NFTs that become your, your CV, none of our users need to know that our investors is quite interesting, but our users don't care. They don't care if it's an NFT. They don't care if it's built in web three. They don't care if it's a cross platform avatar. All they care about is this is a far easier way for me to work out what the hell I'm gonna do with my life. And then ultimately get rid of a lot of that misery that is going on job boards, sending CVs and cover letters, getting rejected all the time. Like it just makes something easier. So I think we're innovating using new technology, but I think a lot of the criticism that comes to the web three and crypto space, especially is that there's a lot of argument about what is the utility? What is the use case for this stuff beyond mm. NFT, you know, images or cryptocurrency, which I think are just the first two very simple use cases. This is the first tech solution I've seen for genuinely replacing a CV. Because even if you looked at LinkedIn, you're still filling out boxes. It's still a CV. It's just a digital version of that. So yeah, I don't want to go on too long, but that's that's a broad brush background into Hundo. No, I love that because for me, a lot of the stuff, well, everything that you've said is extremely obvious to me. The thesis that this is going to be uh, kind of an evolution of how young people generate their work history, uh, interact with employers, that is 
super obvious to me. Uh, again, completely agree with the use cases. The NFTs and crypto are just the preliminary use cases that are easy to kind of understand to some extent. But it's for, for me and you, we're, I can relate to this because I'm trying to overcome the barriers of also people not giving a shit. And, you know, it's the, the realization over the, la the, the last few months, which is it doesn't matter. They don't need to know. We just need to, we, just, we need to, we need to help them understand that this is just a better way to do things. It, it's got to be better. You've nailed it, right? If it's not better, it's not, it's not going to be used. And I always think like my analogy is about these NFTs. Yeah. We use soul band NFTs. It sounds really cool to the average tech person um, or geek. Uh, but actually it's the equivalent of, 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 you know, back in early Facebook days, did you care whether your photos were saved as a PNG or a JPEG? No, you yeah. don't. You just cared that it was a really easy way for all your photos of going out on the lash at uni to be in one place. That was it. That's a great analogy. Um, I'm yeah, I'm gonna have to steal that one. Can we talk a little bit about this transition then from how you moved from being an employee, where again it would be quite nice to hear a little bit about that pain, I guess, around seeing how homogenized CVs are and how essentially kind of useless the entire process is. Um, or inefficient and talking a little bit about kind of how that made gave you the idea of going and founding hundo and then ultimately what the transition from being an employee to that was like because i mean i've kind of i've done that uh it, it you know it i'm currently doing it still and it's painful uh it's it's not an easy thing so we'd love to hear a little bit about how you have made that jump yeah it's i mean part of my experience is what's built the desire to set this company up. So I guess it's very hard to know when you're 18, if you were an entrepreneur, I don't think, you know, maybe, maybe it's arguably a bit easier now, but I don't know how much it's being promoted. And certainly when I was going through education, I was privately educated, went to a Russell group uni, it was very focused on get a degree, get a two one, doesn't matter what it is, get a grad scheme, do that for three years and then you can work out what you want to do which is great and, and it worked really well apart from the fact that i graduated in the middle of the financial crisis in 2008 so all of that turned out to be lies basically because all graduate schemes were cancelled the year i left university um so so i went into recruitment and i'd love to say there was a mission of that but there wasn't like i just didn't want to live in in, in my parents house so went into recruitment in 2009 10 hated that just felt like it was just fairly it wasn't a hugely uh how do i say this engaging job and there's no offense there's great recruiters out there but my brain just didn't work for it so I ended up leaving that but setting up another recruitment company with a, a a more senior team i was the youngest founder of that company and i just felt like oh maybe it's not the industry it's the company it was really great setting up that company and we were really successful and we grew it from five of us in whenever we set up 2011 to about 80 people when I left in 2017. But it took me all of those years to realize actually I, I could do the recruitment side. I just didn't care at all about it. And actually the building of the business side was far more interesting for me. So I'm grateful for that experience because it gave me the confidence, certainly like talking about skills, you know, and what I talk about all the time, what skills are you getting? There's sort of, 50% of me was like, oh, I know what I'm doing. I feel like I've built a business with a bit of a safety blanket around it because I was the youngest and the most and the smallest equity holder. But the other half of me, you're sort of that insecurity was like, well, I've only been a recruiter. What do I really know? I don't know anything. There's no way of really like measuring your skills. With hindsight, now I've made the jump. What it gave me is I was absolutely fearless around meetings. Like that was one thing that I took for granted, which I realized like I will meet anybody of any level in any company and not feel like an imposter, um, which recruitment gave me. And it gives it to you the wrong way, right? Because you just have to make it up and you fake it till you make it. But you go through enough agonizing meetings that you sort of get a thicker skin around it. Um, but when I made the move to set up my business, it just became apparent that I was really bad at working for someone else. I, I, I hated working for someone else, if I'm honest with you. Um, and recruitment is such a transparent model that I knew exactly how much money I was making for my company. And I knew exactly how much money they were paying me. 
Yeah. And there's a very obviously very large gulf between those two numbers. Um, so it became quite obvious that you could do this on your own better. Now, a lot of people leave recruitment to start their own recruitment companies for exactly that reason. It's simple maths. If I just do what I'm doing this year on my own, I'll make 70% more than what I'm being paid for doing this job in a company. What I did want to go down is just the same old route of just doing the same contingent recruitment model. So I used it as my pivot. It's an overused word, but it was a pivot into thinking I needed to feel like I was fixing a social problem. That was part of my lack of fulfillment that I sort of identified over that time period because it was financially rewarding. That was great. But it suddenly helped made me realize that I was driven more by social impact than I was by, by returns. Um, and I also realized having worked with private equity, so I recruited for private equity in that period, I knew what the game was and it is a game. There is a game being played in terms of financing. And I knew that I didn't want to have, I knew the multiples of all the businesses. So by building a tech platform, I know the multiples. So if I'm, if, if you're working in a standard business, a recruitment business, it might have a four or five times multiple. If a tech company has a 15 or 20 times multiple, every dollar you're making or pound you're making in a tech company is that much more valuable than you would be making in a recruitment company because you know what the multiple it's attached to that, that business line is. And that was quite eye-opening for me. And I'm going to be really honest with you. It was like, if I do this business and I'm successful at it, I basically have to work three times less hard to create the same value. And that's a really bad way of thinking about it. So I don't, you know, that's not what I'd say, but ultimately it just seems silly to keep doing this manual thing when I knew that there's tech out there that would create more value more quickly. Now saying that then, so you're saying that there was, uh, you saw an opportunity or in your head, you were like, this could be an op- a way for me to do three times as less work. Um, has that happened? No, of course it hasn't. Uh, cause that, yeah, what you don't remember or what you don't realize is there's a certain drive that you have to have within you to do something. Um, and the thing about being a business owner, the only thing that I struggle with, I don't struggle with it, but the only thing that I really notice is running a business compared to being an employee is you never get to put your business down when you run your business, even if you want to, even if you're like, I'm going to take three weeks off of holiday because you can, because you own the business, it doesn't matter. You'll still think about it all the time. Um, so you can't avoid it that way. So you've got to be really comfortable with, you know, that you're into what you're doing because if you're not into what you're doing, there's no way out other than folding the company. You can't just take three weeks off and get someone to cover your emails and look you out of office. It will never leave you. You can't, you can't stop thinking about it. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I find incredibly impressive about you is your ability to compartmentalize your work life and your social life. Uh, probably a lot better than most entrepreneurs I know. Um, you're, you're, you're very, very effective at that. Uh, but in it also seems that it it doesn't impact negatively in any way your ability to continue like pushing forward with with the business. Have you is that a trait that you either have is that just how you're wired or is that something that you've had to practice? I think it's how I'm wired, honestly, and it stems from I don't know. If it's it's like it's not how long you work at something; it's how effective you work at it. And I always remember like at university, there's people who used to literally be like, oh, I did eight hours in the library today. It's like, if that was like a badge of honor. And I just remember looking Flex. at them being like, what the hell are you doing? Like <laughs> my, my sole mission is if I, if I can do an hour, if I can get everything I need to do in 10 minutes in the library, that's a better achievement. Yeah. The time is not a measure. It's actually how effective you're being with the time um, and being really honest with yourself. One thing I learned from being in the recruitment business is presenteeism yeah. is rife is rife in the in sort of the salary man sector <laughs> presenteeism is insane because i would sit there and i'd know i had to be there from 8 30 till 6 30 at night whatever so if i have five tasks to do that day there is zero incentive for me to do them any faster than that time that time frame allows so it's more about being really honest with yourself getting the outcomes you want to achieve in a week or a day, setting them up quite clearly, 
not being too hard on yourself like that's the other thing i personally avoid uh like entrepreneur podcasts and stuff like that because i think they not all of them but i think some of them set up false views of what success looks like and i think a lot of them provide incredibly glossy retrospectives of people's entrepreneurial journeys um I'd like to listen to a podcast that tells me about the day that they nearly ran out of money because they forgot to pay their VAT or, you know, things that really happen and really yeah. stress you out yeah. because we don't know what we're doing. Like a lot yeah. of the time, if you're, if you're on a journey and trying to create something that's genuinely new, a lot of the time you don't know what you're doing and you're having to figure it out in real time. Yeah. I can relate very heavily to the, the pain around presenteeism. So that's something I share with you with my, I, I also cannot work for people. Um, not that I'm, I was incapable of the same as you, like you're clearly very capable of working for people, but your proclivity is to not be told what to do. And I can, I think that I share the same reasoning, which is I also have a hatred for wasting of time like inefficiency and wasting of time and presenteeism that i felt very much so even just a couple of years ago at my you know my last kind of full-time corporate job uh it felt it felt crazy it felt absolutely crazy and yeah i can uh i, I can relate to the pain that uh that i you know that i felt there um but yeah, I mean, it's. I'm literally just thinking about it now. It's like it just it feels like sends shivers down my spine. Like the sitting there waiting for the clock to go and thinking, "Oh shit, I just need to stay an extra hour just so that my my bosses go and then I'll go yeah. after them just to show that I was there." After you, them. If you step out of that, how ridiculous is that, right? <laughs> I, yeah, I did nothing. Think. I did nothing for that extra hour. I just sat there just being yeah. like on Instagram. I genuinely think by the last year of my job what I was producing in five days, if you really pushed me, I could have done it on Monday morning. <laughs> That's genuinely how much time I was wasting. Okay, well, question to you then. So with that in mind, because, you know, you are very, you're a very effective operator. You are clearly very good at, at doing things. You're very efficient, but so are a lot of people. How do you think that, how does that impact your thinking of employees and the people that work for you and management of those people knowing knowing all that i'm not a good manager that's one thing i know like i don't i i've hired people who are good managers and i have not got i've taken a lot of ego out of the game and i think another part of being in that business previous is i sort of realized that i really like the ideas and the innovation i didn't care about my status i didn't care about my title to this day, I'm still just co-founder. I don't have any title. Um, we hired a CEO who's phenomenal. We hired that very early for a business of our size, but it was just an admission that my, me and my co-founder, what we're really good at is, is selling our dream and selling our vision and going out and having big conversations with big customers about the future. What I don't want to be doing is sitting worrying about our Figma uh, account or you know whether we can you know when's our next fat bill due or you know all this stuff that i literally have i'm terrible at math for one i just don't care is that true is that yeah, true yeah yeah, I, yeah yeah only yeah b i got a b at gcsc maths the only b i got and then um and then yeah basically threw in the towel that was it that's so funny that's um i mean to give a little bit of uh a little bit of color to this so myself and Piers are part of a, uh, a group that we occasionally go golfing every year. And uh, Piers is the person that does the spreadsheets. And so I'd made yeah. an assumption that spreadsheets meant that he loves admin and he loves maths. And he's just uh, admitting now that he hates both of them. Well, you know, when you play golf, I like, like I do, you only have to count to five. So it's pretty easy. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, I, I can confirm that's the only number that peers can count to as well. I tested his maths the other days. <laughs> that's right, I have a calculator on my phone as well. That's what. That's another. Yeah, I mean, I've got one on my bloody. I, I've got one on my bloody watch, mate. I mean, the last time I had exactly. one of these on my watch, I was I was at eleven, and exactly. it still worked. Why did same, we yeah. learn? Why did we learn all that algebra and long division? I just I just can do. I can just get a calculator from my phone. But I think, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 that knowing what I'm bad at. And trying to make 
adjustments or changes in the business i always say i want to have a bit i only ever want to have a business that i really want to work in i never lose sight of that like no matter what investors say what my board says it's my business i set it up because i don't like working for other people so it's got to be a business that i want to work in and other people want to work in my probably my I, I treat all of my employees like adults we don't have any sort of we have core hours but they're not really enforced you just have work and if you do it you do it no one's checking up like as long as you're delivering take time out i don't care i'm not i, I can honestly not tell you when my employees work if they want to work saturday and sunday that's fine i don't care it's just about producing that's all we really work towards so um, and question that's, for that's you so as someone who's that's doing this for the first time building a tech solution for the first time how and you're like okay well there's work to be done how do you forecast how much effort needs to go into that work or is it just a case of you're just you have hired people that are experts and you just rely on their you just you just trust them you've got to trust your team so I, I, my advice would be anybody founding a tech company if you're not a tech person like me you know i came both me and my co-founder came with a very big social vision and zero tech background whatsoever so the first hire we made is our tech co-founder scott who is phenomenal um, and understands tech and as i said we've got a ceo you've got to really talk to each other all the time because otherwise you're setting each other up for failure i can go and sell to a big company the dream and then promise them a load of stuff to get them over the line and then Scott's sitting there and being like, but we, we've got to deliver, this will require a whole sprint build to do this and we've got no resource and you're going to kill our tech team if you do it. So you just have to use the experts you have around you before you make any promises to actually make sure that everything you're doing is deliverable in a way that's manageable for the resource that you have. And that is the constant battle of being a startup or even a scale up is you're always under-resourced. You've got to work and it's such an but you've got to work so lean and I think a lot of people get really hung up on the bells and whistles of their product when actually the best businesses have just a very good, slick customer service base, deliver good product in a lean way to those customers. And then all the bells and whistles of the product can come later. You've got to build that like core relationship with people who like what you're doing, understand the product that you're building, understand the context of where you are as a business. So they're not expecting you to come and deliver you know, like a Salesforce level suite of product in, in year one, but they understand where you are in your journey, what they're paying for today, and then what they might be paying for in a year down the line and two years down the line as you project out that runway. Well, let's talk a little bit about that then. So you've been, you've done a fantastic job raising a couple of rounds of venture capital. Last year, you raised £2 million. Uh, could you give a little bit of hindsight uh, to how that process went and perhaps think about things that maybe you would you tell your younger self before going through that process what kind of stuff did you learn i mean i learned a lot i don't know how many vc is going to watch this so i've got to be slightly careful what i say but i think um <laughs> look there's so many funds out there and the market is very different now but it was red hot last year yeah. so it's quite interesting to see um the contrast how it changes so quickly in the market um, from a you know from a bull market where people are just pumping money at ridiculous valuations to where we are now where there's a lot more scrutiny uh, around your sort of route to market your actual route to profitability how you actually make money as a company all of those things so it's quite interesting because it's it's there's such a herd the investors the vc world you just need one to back you they do the diligence and then it, you'll get three other investors i guarantee just piggyback off that due diligence um so it's a bit of a game that you have to play my number one piece of advice if we're talking about founders is you have to advocate for yourself and your business do not kid yourself that a vc cares about you or your company in any way that they say they do. Now, I'm tarring all VCs with the same brush here. There must be good ones and bad ones. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying as a general rule, you go in defensive, no one will care about you or your business like you care about you or your business. So you have to advocate for yourself throughout the process. And there is a ecosystem that surrounds VC investment that slants all the favor towards the investor and not towards the entrepreneur. In my darker days, in my more savage days, I often think that I'm sat in a room with 
when, when you're talking to a VC analyst, they're usually younger than me. They're reading out a script, asking me the same questions. I just feel like it's a completely impersonal process. Um, and they are doing a tick box exercise, right? Do not kid yourself about anything that they say. The truth is they are spread betting on entrepreneurs of one of them being, they want, they basically say, they'll tell you this up front. They say, what, when we invest in you, our return is the fund. We want you to return the fund. What that means is that your business has to be, the potential your business profitability has to be so high that it will return the entire fund, which they might invest into 60 or 70 companies, just off their investment in you. I think they try and say that to sound impressive, but to me, it just sounds like, oh, right. So basically of the hundred businesses you invest in, you're writing 99 of them off, every single fund, every single funding round, which is spread betting really, isn't it? And let's be real, yeah. that's what it is because there's no data. They're going, they're going on really scant data. So when you're looking at financing, I would, always advocate for yourself never forget your mission and what you want to achieve as a company and what you want the company you want to work for and don't buy the bullshit like they will all tell you that they will introduce you to their ecosystem da, 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 da. for some reason every single fund seems to have invested into paypal do you know what i mean like they can't all have done it but everyone's <laughs> quoting alumni uh, yeah and, and and so cut through all of that it's money it's fuel for your engine and you've got to make sure you're happy with the terms of how you're getting that fuel and then don't forget there's other levers so you've got angels who had you know are great and have a whole different host of issues you've got debt financing you've got um, convertible notes i think are really underused in this part of the world like i think they're much more common in the us but getting something that you can actually just, you know, if you if you actually nail it and you're doing well, you can just convert it into debt. And you've got all your company still there. Um, I think this sort of this equity VC model that through Dragon's Den or whatever has been held up as this holy grail of achievement. And I just don't I just don't think it is. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned about the herd mentality as well, because uh, to me, one of the most kind of crazy examples of that was the FTX collapse you know, only, only a couple of months ago where you have all of the biggest institutional investors on planet earth who have all managed to miss the due diligence of whatever the fuck was going on there. Um, but as you said, it's fine. Cause they were, they, that was just one of their bets. That was one of their bets. And sure. That was a big bet that ended up, that could have been huge, but, um, you know, it made sense for everyone just to chuck in, chuck in, you know, chuck in some, um, yeah. But yeah I, I agree. I think that's, I think we look even further past that. You don't even have to look at the scandals like Theranos or FTX. Look at, look at WeWork, look at Uber even. Like none of them actually made any profit. So it's, it's sort of dependent, especially at the end. And, and again, I don't want to knock VCs because they do what they do well and they do provide really important capital. But to me, sometimes I feel like they're, they're kind of misaligned because really they're just trying to they're trying to, it's a hype train. If you look at these things, it's a hype train where the valuations are pushed up and up and up. The VC's real sort of focus is to get out at growth stage. So they just need to keep the hype train going until a growth investor comes in and buys them out. Yeah. So actually they're not even really aligned with the business being a proper business and successful. They're aligned with the hype train continuing to a point where they can exit at their return that they want and then let someone else deal with the issues. And that's what you see, I think, with like WeWork and Uber is that the hype train has just continued and continued. And then someone's left at the end with a huge investment and then desperately trying to work out how it makes money. And then you see those massive valuation corrections that you see like WeWork being a classic example um, because suddenly realize actually this is not valuable as half as valuable as everybody's telling me. Um, a friend of mine used to have this great analogy where they were a consultant, so it's a similar model, but it's like fishing the fund has to like so they get someone to swim down and pull the line and they're like oh we've got a massive one we've got a massive one and they hand it over to the to the sort of large cap or mid cap investor then the person that's going to oh you let it go like well it's your fault you know it was going to be massive but you lost it like that that is a really good analogy of in a say it's not all the time but i think if you look at those hyper evaluated like really highly evaluated companies valued companies, valued, valued companies. Um, there's that hype train that 
will they'll they'll hit the wall at some point and then you've got this big valuation issue that comes at the end of that have you seen any differences in the funding rounds that you've done um as in like the process or any perhaps the way people speak to you or approach you or have you noticed anything like that no i think i'm more cynical clearly about it than i was at the beginning um i think the the real change is like the market well the market shows you how unimportant your company is if that makes sense because whether the whether it's a bull market or a bear market if you're sitting there as an investor and saying i back founders who have world changing ideas a bull market or a bear market shouldn't impact that idea because you're so early on but it does impact the idea because the world that you can raise money in is completely changed so that's where that sort of narrative doesn't add up to me it's like why is my good idea that you think is worth a billion dollars now not as worth the same amount just because the market's changed surely the idea is exactly the same and we're so early on in the journey the potential is exactly the same so why are we prospecting because russia's you invaded ukraine that that idea is now less valuable to me just in my mind of how that that doesn't connect together to me is that cynically potentially a let like a kind of negotiation leverage tool in any way like i mean i don't know i don't know i don't think so I think it's his herd mentality. I genuinely do. I think yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's the way that markets always worked. Funding dries up because everyone gets a bit nervous. And then once people stop investing, once the big players stop investing, little players stop investing, everyone sits on their powder. They, they haven't got any reason to spend it, you know? Um, and there is the other side of it, whereas, you know, if they just let you sweat it as an in, as, a, as an entrepreneur, if you're still there in six months, probably a better investment is their view. Yeah. How have you, uh, obviously you must have thought about how you're going to navigate this kind of like economic downturn. Um, I think about this a lot being that this, I was the same as you, I was in university, my first university um degree when the last financial crisis happened back in 2008 and the world was such a different place then than it is now like information if we think about the platforms that we have access to the social media uh, platforms that we use all day every day that didn't exist back then and the just the transmission of internet the volume uh, the transmission of information and the volume of information is so different have you thought about that at all or have, has that have you kind of looked back and be like okay well this is this happened i kind of know how this is going to play out because back then i was t totally naive to what you know a, an economic downturn meant for me as coming out of school or university but now i feel a little bit more prepared about exactly what it means like the the fear i don't have fear which is what i did have back then can you relate to that yeah, I think so. I think there's um, there's the other thing as well, where it's like with the economy and global economy, it's so big. What are you going to do about it? You know, I mean, what is the point of worrying about that? You can't control that. You can only control what you can control. So for me, when I look at it, I don't worry about the economy at all. I worry about my runway. That's all I really like. My stress levels increase in a direct correlation to the shortening of the runway so as long as i can keep a 12 to 18 month runway in front of me i know i've still got a fighting chance of making this business successful now the outside world affects how i build that runway it affects the tools i can use to build that runway right so i know in this downturn that the tools i won't have is fundraising because i don't want to raise money Again, this is a ridiculous thing. I, I would have to raise money now at a lower valuation, not because my business is any worse, just because yeah. that's where the market is. It's not reflective of me as a company. So I don't want to do that. So I've got, you've got debt or something that's probably not talked about enough in these, these conversations. You have customers, you have revenue. Like rev, this is the best thing that you know, we, we decided this year that we've done our last round, we're relatively well capitalized, we've got runway, 
this is the time to make revenue because if we can make revenue now even if it's not you know sustainable for the whole business but just helps extend the runway to two years or whatever that's great for my personal mental health but also it's making our business look better for any future funding rounds so i think people sort of worry about getting more equity sold or selling more of the whatever or getting more debt if you've got a product and i appreciate we're, we we are post products so if you're pre-products i can't you know this is not good advice but if you're post product get out there and try and sell something you know um and and one it will make you feel great because selling stuff your own product makes you feel great makes you feel a lot better than raising money i can tell you that um but two it is actually strengthening your argument for going back to market and that's what i've come you know as i've gone through this experience with my founders we have decided i want to go to market if i do another round i know all the metrics i know all of the things that these funds want to see because they've told me right every fund that says no to you will tell you why and they'll tell you this is what i want to see so you write that down and then you come back a year later and you say right i'm, I'm 10 percent ahead of these things what are you saying now you know you have such a stronger argument and then you can push your valuation up you're sort of trying to make yourself the most attractive investment opportunity and you you're arming yourself with that knowledge if you've got enough time if you can buy yourself enough time you can bang your business into the right shape to go and do a proper round of decent cash at a valuation that's acceptable to you otherwise if you don't do that you are at the sort of mercy of a macro market you you know people who are coming to a funding round now are all doing down rounds because they are running out of money and they have no choice but to raise money at a lower valuation to keep the company going um, and that is a position i don't really ever want to find myself in yeah I avoid. yeah i can understand that because i mean something that i found out a few months ago which was this shift in sentiment with or yeah, it, within the kind of vc world which was this okay well you know we have pumped a, a shit ton of money into many businesses and now we want to see profitability we want to see revenue producing business models have you have you noticed that at all from a kind of a have, have vcs kind of put, put put that up towards you guys being like you know focus on this yeah yes i agree again the cynic in me would say how much do they care about your profitability or how much do their um, lps care you know yeah there's a food chain at play so lps aren't going to invest money in those funds if they're not seeing returns but inevitably there's so much money still to be invested i don't believe that will be the sentiment forever i just think it's where we sit today it's sort of the buzzy word but if the world picks up again there's still loads of money out there you'll start to see the valuations creep up it's just so cyclical um but putting those funders to one side it's just business fundamentals like this is again the model warps it but you've got to make money like the reason why you're being invested in is to make money now i have a social impact business so i have another reason for doing it but i don't kid myself i'm not of charity i'm not people aren't investing in me thinking oh there's peers he's doing nice things for young people i'll never see that money again they want they want returns um yeah. so yeah the business fundamentals are right like whether the markets are good or bad you should always have a route to profitability or at least a route to revenue to start off with do you think you understand money? Do I understand money? That's a very good question. Um, I think I've got a pretty good idea of macro markets and how money works. I think I've got a good understanding of the value of a pound. Um, but in the pure business sense, all money is, is fuel for the engine. And I think some people will call me tight, but I've never been one for, I think there's sort of a bit of a thing that some startups can do where you get a bit sort of excited and into it. And I see it a lot where, you know, you go into a startup office and they've got branded, you know, everything. Everything. Yeah. You know? I'm in what I'm, three years into this now i still not we don't even have a sign we don't even have a hundo sign because i can't even bring myself to think of the day 
that I'd have to take that sign down. <laughs> That's genuinely why you haven't got a sign. Um, so I think if you look at it purely as I go back to that point, it's runway, it's time. You're buying yourself. The money is buying you time to achieve the things that you know you can achieve to get you to the next stage, to make more money through investment, revenue, et cetera, et cetera, to then do the next stage. So it's fuel to buy you time to achieve your goals. Um, and that's it, you know, I think. The only other thing I will say about money, which is my learning is be an advocate for yourself and pay yourself. If you're taking investment, part of the reason why investment is so slanted towards privately educated males is because they are the ones who can afford to pay themselves 30 grand or whatever a year to go and sell a business. Yeah. If you've got a family and you're living in central London, you don't come from an affluent background, you should pay yourself 70, a hundred grand, whatever it costs, because it's in the investor's interest for you to not be delivering or whatever your weekends to make the ends meet to your family. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, totally. It's, uh, you know, by paying you 20 grand more, the funds and all your investors are getting way more for their money than if they don't pay 20 grand and you're spending half the week trying to do something else. Have you, in your experience, do investors, do you, do you think investors, I mean, I guess smart ones clearly do, but is that been your experience? Do they actually empathize with that? I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is you have, you are the ultimate, you are the final decision maker in the business. Whatever you think, whatever your board says, you have the ultimate power as a founder because it's your idea. They're investing in your idea. If you decide that you're not going to do that idea, they all lose their money immediately. And they have no recourse really, you know? So I've never played the card, you know, I've never, I've never had to, but I just think as a founder, and I can't I keep saying this, you are an advocate for yourself. You are, you are the person with this idea. You have a huge value. If these investors had your idea, they wouldn't invest in you. They wouldn't need to. So that's why I sort of look around a room in the VCs and it's like, yeah, you know, I am the asset or my idea is the asset here you should be you should be happy to be part of that rather than me yeah. feeling like you know i'm lucky to be here yeah because no, let's be honest I, if these vc analysts had good ideas they wouldn't be working in the vc would they i mean so i mean i i, I can bash vcs because i don't work with them but um uh yeah i mean my favorite is when you go go on a vc's linkedin and it's there an advisor for 50 startups and it's like, it's just, it's like, I know, I know for sure you don't know shit about running and operating a business. Yeah. Um, I don't want to knock VCs too much because some, some VCs and RVCs like to their credit have been phenomenal, like phenomenal people and you know, no bearing on their level of investment or how big the check is. It's not like the biggest check gives you the most help. Yeah. They've gone out of their way to bring in clients, contacts, connections, get us on accelerators. Like there are very good VCs out there, but there are also, I think, funds that just, you know, as I say, it's that spread betting mentality. It's just, do you tick the boxes? Yes, you tick the boxes, right? Here's the term sheet, sign that, off you go. We'll come to your board meetings once a month as an observer, we'll never say anything, and then that's it. Yeah. You know, can we, feel can, like that's fine. Yeah, should we, um, should we list the top five of ones that do that? What? <laughs> I don't know, mate. I honestly don't know. Like, <laughs> I can tell you that I we've probably spoken to in excess of seventy-five VCs, maybe in my time. Yeah. And I have one, two, three, four invested in me, who I love. Don't get me wrong. Um, and actually, over the time that. I know them. They, you know, they they come to our parties. They come and do stuff with our employees. Like they've really made an effort to ingrain themselves in our company, which I'm really grateful for. But there is definitely you'll get it if you are raising money. You'll get a sort of spider sense for it of the people who are sat yeah. there. Just yeah. you usually know in the first three questions because they ask you silly things like, "What's your MRR?" And you're like, "Hold on, I haven't launched the product." And then you're like, <laughs> "All right, like okay, this is great. This is going to go really well," you know. <laughs> 
Yeah. You know, I, I've heard these stories. Yeah. Acquisition. I don't know because the product hasn't launched. I, <laughs> whereas the ones that we found are really great are the ones who are like, they're all they talk about is your idea and your vision. Yeah. And then they look, and then all they're talking about after they've got the sort of, once they got the arms around the idea and the vision, what they're really push you on is what do you need to achieve this? So they want to know that you know what you need to do, what you're going to do with that money. Um, that's the best VC conversations I have. And yeah. the ones that are just sort of paint by numbers, just, you, know, just, you just know it 10 minutes in. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about gaming? And you mentioned this earlier. And I mean, I know you and I know that you are competitive, like when we play sports together, not Uber, not like crazy competitive, but you you like you like games, you like you do like you like gaming. You mentioned business, uh you mentioned gaming and business, um, in the context of business, that it's a game. And that's something that I've learned in the last few years, and that it really is just a case of there are rules. It's your job to understand what the hell those rules are. And mm -hmm. ideally, go and figure out what the cheat codes are. Um, yeah. Can you do, do you do you empathise with that at all? Yeah, I definitely do. Because I think the other good analogy of it is, is like, you know, especially when you're doing something like I'm doing, which is trying to affect like social change at global scale. Like, you can very easily end up in like the the ether of the great idea. And like talk about that forever and obviously people love talking about that you know you're 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 you'll talk to anybody all day long about that big big picture stuff and that's fine but actually when you break it down you're just trying to complete the level that you're on what i mean by that is you need to hit the metrics or the key sort of milestones that you know you need to hit which will be defined by various conversations you have internally as a team or with investors etc to get to the next stage or the next level of the game um, and as long as you're aligning your vision and your principles as a business with the metrics you're trying to hit to get to the end of the level, they shouldn't, they shouldn't compete with each other. It should be pretty sort of hand in glove in the way that those things go along to each other. But it becomes, you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to affect social change at global scale and get rid of the CV and help refugees by giving them a blockchain verified base you know, skills wallet that they can carry with them throughout the world, even if they're displaced from their own country. That's great. And that's very grand and very admirable. But really this year, I want to get to 100,000 users and grow our content by 16 times is my focus. So that's an actual achievable goal that I can quantify for this level for this year that's pushing me towards that grand vision still, but ultimately is also helping me get to that next hurdle of an investment or a buyout or whatever the next stage of the business development is. Yeah. When you're at work and things don't go to plan. So let's very say, for example, you get to the end of the year and you haven't done your 16 multiple on your content and, oh my God, we've only done two and people start stressing you. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, I've been in offices where you can feel tension. Um, you kind of alluded earlier about the management side of things and I, did want to ask you about that like what was the situation in which you kind of really that was that became apparent to you but how do you stay calm how do you you know or do you just like offload it to people and just rely on other people to help situations like that uh no look without going into too much details i've definitely made wrong decisions in the company before um, and we have as a management team and we've had to sort of front up and rectify those decisions pretty quickly that's all you can do. You're not going to get everything right. There's this like, there's a sort of, there's a radical transparency that we sometimes call it, which, I'm, you know, is like letting everybody know the context of where your business is, what you're trying to do, how your runway looks, et cetera, et cetera. It's a bit of a tightrope because too much, you know, I have all the information. I can live with that information. Sometimes telling my junior, junior staff that, you know, we've got three months left before we run out of money is terrifying for them it's terrifying for me but it's more terrifying yeah, for them because they're, yeah, they're, they're yeah. young so there's a fine line to to be to be sort of trodden on that but i think try and treat, treat people with respect people are all in the startup game together you know i'd hope you don't come to work in a startup or a small company like ours 
and expect it to be like KPMG. You know, like it's just not, it's, it's horses for courses. So there's that. And I think what you alluded to, and it's really cliche, the hardest thing I've worked on is just not fearing failure, which is so cliched. And of course you obviously always will fear it in a certain respect. But if you boil it down, as long as you're in a position to make sure that you know you can get another job, you'll be fine, like you will be okay, like it is not defining your entire life and existence, then you can just about manage that stress. I think when it becomes all encompassing and you feel like your entire reputation is staked on this idea, or whatever your reputation's worth, that's when it becomes overly stressful and it will damage you and damage your relationships with other people at the same time. Are you able to look at things objectively and say, because thinking about that, I know that the odds of you becoming that, that business that ends up completing, completely getting the entire fund, the chances of that happening are extremely low. Do you kind of, does that kind of make you feel, okay, well, failure is actually, there's a high, high, high chance of failure. Um, I just know that essentially no matter what happens, I'm going to be fine. But, you know, so does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I think, yeah, I think you having that context of, you know, you're, you're, you're buying a ticket to the tech lottery and, and, and not everybody can be a winner or very few people can be a winner. That's part of it. But also having, I guess, the stupidity or arrogance or self-confidence, whatever you want to call it, to think I can kind of work out how to make money. So even if my pivots and stuff means I have a mediumly successful business compared to my astronomic, no, you know, not everybody's going to make a unicorn. No one's going to make a unicorn. But even if you make a business that's valued at 250 million quid, you're going to be fine. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think... You, as long as you back yourself mentally to stay the course and make more right decisions than wrong decisions, you'll eke it out. It, and I don't think, you know, I don't, I am not a, a, the great entrepreneur. Like you see some great entrepreneurs who are really good at working out how to create the most value really quickly. You know, they'll be like, here's my four year plan to getting this business to this valuation. I'm going to sell it that's great for them. And I'm sure they do it really well. I just know I'm not built like that. I have to be mission driven. I have to be solving a social problem. I therefore know it's not going to be that straight line. But I do fundamentally believe is if I make more right decisions than wrong, I concentrate on generating value in my company and generating a revenue model that is sustainable, then worst case scenario, I have a good business that I pay myself well from that's delivering what I wanted to deliver in the world that makes me happy and I can pay my investors their divs or whatever they get out of it. That's the worst case scenario. Best case scenario is, you know, someone comes along and buys it for a billion quid in two years and I can go and play golf the rest of my life. But, but that's probably not going to happen. So I don't think you need to put it in the binary terms of it's unicorn or bust, which I think some people sort of get that headset. Yeah. That, that mindset like quite early on it doesn't there's a million ways that businesses can be successful yeah and you you know and it doesn't all require you being the next elon musk the next elon musk will some some may say that you are the next elon musk i have heard that by the way yeah i hope not he is i mean his gags are absolutely shocking for starters <laughs> yeah he's he is the he's the emperor of dad jokes isn't he I mean, if you're that rich, just get a writer's room, wouldn't you? Yeah, you think so, right? But he loves yeah, it. He, he loves being on. He loves being on the tools. That's the one thing about Elon. He likes being in there in the trenches. Yeah, true. Yeah, I mean, his some of his his tweets are absolutely terrible. They are terrible. They are. Um, mate, I'd love to thank you so much for spending some time with me, and you know, talked about stuff that we typically don't get the chance to speak about. Is there any advice that you'd like to give to people who potentially would be looking to get into the tech industry, doing what we're doing? Um, we're playing really at the bleeding edge of this stuff. Have you got any advice to anyone? Yeah, hundred percent. I think write yourself off as not being able to do it. If you're not a tech person, I think that is becoming actually one of the least important things. 
Um, you know, you've got like low code, no code solutions. You've got lots of good tech people out there in the market at the moment who you can get to help you. I say, you know, getting a technical co-founder is really important early on. If you don't have one, try and find one. There's lots. You know, you can you can find a, a lot of good tech people out there. Um, but it goes back to that point at the beginning, right? You don't have to invent things. You don't have to come up with something that's completely new. The technology in Web3 and the future of the internet is already there and it's already in place. Even if you're looking at, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, blockchain, you know, quantum, AI, ML, all this stuff that's getting really buzzy is already happening. Where the marketplace is, is how you, how you innovate that existing technology. So if you can find a unique innovation for this new tech, you don't need to be a tech person to do that. You just need to be a good strategic thinker. Um, and then you can build the team behind you. So don't feel like you have to know how to write code or, you know, be a product person. You don't. You just need to be able to think how I utilize existing tech to solve existing problems. And then you can build a business around that. Amazing. How can people follow along with Hondo's journey? Where, where do they need to go? All the socials. We've got a phenomenal social squad. Uh, so hundo.xyz is the platform. Um, we have obviously big following on TikTok. Uh, also, you know, classic LinkedIn, Twitter, all the good spaces. Um, but yeah, sign up at hundo.xyz. It's free. You can build yourself an avatar, start exploring the content, set up your own skills wallet. Um, and even if you want to start sending us stuff to upload and verifying as your skills, so start building a digital CV tomorrow. Sick. I mean, I've already got my avatar, so I need to start doing the the digital skills. Um, yeah, well, come we're launching CareerCon November this year um, with 16 verticals, including AI, ML, Web3, Cyber, got Future of Education, Future of Finance, which is obviously quite an interesting space at the moment. Um, with hundreds of companies basically delivering content around what that looks like for them, what the future of work looks like for them. It's predominantly focused on attracting talent to those industries. So if you're ever thinking, this is something I completely don't understand, don't understand the context, we're a really good place to start um, and start engaging with companies who are doing quite cutting edge stuff across a whole load of what we call sort of future tech, future of work spaces. Right, awesome. Piers, thank you so much for joining me, man. Pleasure, man. Let's and, have uh, to do it. Great. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm looking to try and get these things done with my guests once every maybe 18 months to 24 months, especially because I'm trying to kind of keep alongside uh, or at least follow the journeys of people who are at not similar stages to me, but places where they're fairly early on in their career and just seeing uh, seeing how things go. So yeah, we'd love to catch up in the future. Well, I'll either be... Uh doing really well or are we back being a salary man so we'll have to wait and see waiting until 6 30 yeah exactly nearly now isn't it Go <laughs> it's home. nearly now it. yeah nearly now Piers, thank you very much mate all right mate always a Piers, pleasure buddy. i hope you enjoyed that show if you haven't already done so hit the like button down below make sure to subscribe so that you can learn from the very best that i'm going to be interviewing at the summit club if you didn't know this already i also have another podcast called the unorthodox podcast that i do with my co-founders Liam and Mark over at Unorthodox, we're a Web3 marketing consultancy. If you want to go check it out, it's quite a lot of fun. If you want to learn a bit more about crypto and everything Web3, that's the place to come check it out. We interview some of the most interesting people within Web3 and also executives across some of the biggest brands on the planet. Come and join us. The links are also going to be down below in the description and I'll see you next time.